thank you, Martha, for the introduction. Uh, again, uh, I'm very honored to be here. And this is actually my second time uh, sharing our research. And this time, actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the algorithms uh, that are more specific to the, uh, our approach for adaptive learning. And a lot of the work actually came from uh, joint research uh, with uh, uh, Stanford Research Institute, which is kind of like a couple blocks from here. And also uh, from Carnegie Mellon uh, University, we have actually a joint lab with uh, CMU called uh, CMU Score AI Research Lab on Personalized Learning at Scale. So that's, uh, that's a, it's a, a long-term collaboration that we have uh, with them. Uh, and also, we would like to expand those uh, research uh, collaborations also with Stanford uh, and with uh, other institutions that are interested in those endeavors. And actually, I'm going to go into a little bit more details than last time, because last time we were talking about our general approach. But we're a, a, uh, you know, we're a company providing K-12 after-school education using AI as a primary uh, differentiator. Uh, and we use AI and try to diagnose student and also recommend uh, content and recommend uh, instructional set uh, for the student on the fly in real time. So, and we use human coach along with uh, AI to do that. So I'm going to a little bit of our details uh, of uh, you know, what type of algorithm we're using and what are the research interests we have uh, and the, uh, again, the name for today's talk is about the algorithms for adaptive education. So, so what is coming uh, in terms of the, um, you know, the AI? I think there are a lot of advances just in recent years. Uh, so much work has been done in terms of accelerating uh, progresses in um, both deep learning as well as the general AI applications using big data. And actually, I want to make two examples here, uh, even though those are not directly used in education, but those are the fundamental research advances that actually is going to be super helpful for uh, the applications that we're building. So one uh, example is the superhuman perception. You know, both of these papers that I quoted here are from last year uh, and uh, 2017. And the um, one is about using diagnosis skin cancer uh, using image, right? This is a deep learning application. And the, on this one, it's the risk constructing an unseen object across a corner. Uh, again, this was published uh, last year. And both of these are kind of like amazing uh, application that even human cannot do, right? You know, but human I cannot see across a corner, but uh, a computer with the right algorithm can do that by Again, the deflections by the other things that are like shadows and so forth, and that's uh, pretty amazing. The other one that uh, is a very interesting is uh, on the natural language processing side. Uh, you probably hear, hear uh, or heard uh, you know, a lot of this buzzword, right? You know, a lot of them has to do with uh, uh, Elmo, <laughs> Bert, you know, all these uh, um, Sesame Street characters, right? But those are very interesting advances in terms of the technologies that are being used. Uh, you know, I think the one advance is, is really in the, uh, the capability for a computer to understand uh, speeches and understanding uh, natural language passages and question and answers. So there's a very uh, famous um, data set called the SQUAD, S-Q-U, uh, S-Q, uh, what is S -Q uh, Stanford question and answer uh, data set, the squad data set. And uh, the advances in that area, even from two years ago to now, uh, it's just tremendous, right? So the latest one, I think it's a combination of a BERT uh, that, and also some of the XLNet, right? If you see uh, from Elmo to BERT and to GPT and GPT-2, and also to XLNet, and now there's Albert, uh, which are, the BERT is, uh, is an algorithm that created by um, uh, Google. And the, the latest, I uh, just you know, saw the number like from two weeks ago, the, uh, both the BERT and also the XLNet um, algorithms have achieved better question and answer capability by 
you know, than human. Uh, these are, again, I mean, these are not uh, all the questions, but this specific question set that is like more facts based, but by the computer algorithm can use so much of capability to understand and reuse a lot of knowledge you know, from the understanding and be able to reproduce answers and give the right answers and better than human. Uh, so that's just, uh, that's just amazing in terms of you know, what type of progress. And we're actually using that. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we're going to use that in our algorithm and so forth. So let's imagine this future, right? And this is our vision. And also, I think that's also part of the reason uh, that we're involved in like IEEE and also involved in the uh, Carnegie Mellon um, you know, uh, uh, joint lab. And also, oh, by the way, we're also creating an award uh, for AI for humanity. Uh, along with the uh, three different associations, uh, Triple AI, uh, the um, and the Europe AI, and also China AI, and we're going to actually announce a award uh, as uh, Triple AI, and the Triple AI uh, uh, Score AI Award for benefit to humanity uh, using AI, and as an uh, individual contribution uh, uh, award, it's uh, going to carry a million dollar per year uh, award. And that's, uh, you know, we hope that going to really improve the awareness of how this AI can be uh, applied uh, to benefit, to benefit uh, of humanity there. And, but again, coming back to our vision there, we want to build these uh, capabilities around this super AI tutor along with the human coach. And then combining that, we can create a process of diagnosis, recommendations, collaborations, and motivations so that the human, uh, along with the AI together, will be able to provide a very personalized uh, education path for every kid in a very scalable way and economical way. And there's no way that we can do that with human alone because the cost is so prohibitive, right? But with AI now getting cheaper and cheaper, we can see that it's happening. And the, the, the technologies that we're going to talk about are these pieces that allow that whole process. So think about uh, an analogy of uh, how the personalized adaptive learning works is that it's almost like a GPS system, right? So that the first thing is that you have to see where the student is uh, in their learning journey. And then you have to have a good map. And then you basically navigate the student along a better or optimal pathway to achieve the learning goals. Right? And along the way, you need to have uh, continuous diagnosis, so you, you know, continuous update on where you are in that journey and continuously find what is a better way. Just like we're, you know, like a driving, I'm driving today uh, from the Thouse uh, to Stanford. Along the way, I keep getting adjusted in terms of which route can get me here <laughs> before it's too late. And that is all based on the online traffic pattern and also depending on where you are, you know, what is the best way to do that. So for us, the algorithms that serve a purpose in diagnosing what the learner's, learner's learning state and also try to understand the map uh, in a very dynamic way with the context right, to give the better policies. This is one that Emma actually talked about earlier today. How do you actually use either reinforced learning or some kind of like a dynamic uh, programming algorithm in order to achieve uh, better um, you know, outcome uh, by changing or adjusting those policies, either in a longer term or even in a short term. And the, along the way, also, the, how, do we, how do we really uh, enable that uh, in the learning environment? That requires the collaboration between a human, uh, we call it a human coach in our uh, practices, uh, and, and also how do the student and the teachers can give feedback 
to the machine learning algorithms so that the machine can learn better policies along the way, as well that as um, you know, during the practice time to adjust them accordingly. And then there are also other aspects which we call that in the, we call the inner loop, right? So if you think about adaptivity, you can do adaptive at the outer loop where you're talking about what task is optimal for the student at the next second. But also within that task itself, there is a lot of the adaptivity in terms of you know, what do we know about the students, what they know, what they don't know, what are the gaps in terms of the understanding, what are the better uh, mechanisms to interact with the student. In that case, it could be a conversational AI. We have uh, uh, done this work with SRI, along with also CMU, uh, on, on building better conversational AI capability to do that. <coughs> also, uh, to have capabilities that can diagnose at the same time and create a dynamic learning environment and the contacts to, uh, for the student. So that we call that an inner loop adaptivity. So, but if you look at the uh, research interests we have, these are the four big categories uh, to enable all of that. The four categories uh, we call the learner model, domain model, Turing model, and interface model, right? So under each model, you have different algorithms that will basically enable these uh, different types of functions that AI is performing. So in that case, we can say, uh, you know, learner model is really about diagnosing, right? Figure out what the student's state. Right? And in that, uh, we have an algorithm called Monty Model uh, Integrated Behavioral Analysis. Uh, again, that the work we have done along with UC Berkeley and um, University of Toronto and also SRI um, using more modalities, you know, not only how the students are behaving on their uh, interaction with the computer tutor, but also looking at their facial expression, eye gazing, uh, and also in some of the cases we also have EEG that you know, the student actually wear uh, along, basically it's like a earphone uh, with a couple sensors uh, that can uh, look at their EEG signals and to see whether the student is in focus, uh, whether the student is engaged or not, and using those to help the diagnosis part of it. We also have a lot of advances uh, in using deep learning to enhance um, the traditional models of cognitive models of understanding the student's learning state, which are the BKTs, the, you know, the, the KSTs type of stuff. And uh, we also develop our own algorithm uh, as a machine learning algorithm called a multidimensional probabilistic knowledge state model. And uh, uh, that is, um, uh, is getting a much better, uh, I would say, uh, diagnosis. It's about 25% uh, improvement over the current uh, BKT model um, and, um, and that's uh, something that we are uh, having uh, papers published around that. Same way with uh, dynamic learning goals uh, that are, uh, we are using to uh, change, uh, which is mostly a dynamic, dynamic programming model uh, that we can use to adjust the student learning goal on the fly, right? And uh, either at the beginning of the class or uh, at the beginning of a certain session. Right? Um, and then the domain models, a lot of these are about ontology. I think we have a later talk about knowledge graph. And we built uh, uh, a lot of knowledge graph for the different part of our subject areas. Uh, and then we also have a more general knowledge graph. And a lot of the capabilities is how to use those knowledge graph, like we call them learning map, right? to help we understand how the student progress and what are the related uh, areas for their learning. And also what is, uh, uh, what, what do we call the, um, the, um, uh, the um, approximate uh, zone of development, right? So, so that we can see where is their optimal uh, place that they should find tasks from. Um, and also, there's a lot of the work that you have seen earlier, like the, uh, the NLP work and so forth that is uh, advanced uh, in the field, can help us to improve the automated uh, content curation, not a graph generation, and also uh, advanced uh, adaptive uh, content authoring, like 
generating question on the fly, generating answer that are relevant to the student on the fly, and so on and so forth. And on the tutoring model, so these are a lot of the RILs type of stuff, the reinforced learning stuff. One thing that uh, actually I was uh, discussing offline with Emma is that we are actually using one of the technology called the simulated student, also a called apprentice learner model. It's a simulator to simulate how a student learn based on what type of content they are exposed. And then using that simulator to guide the, uh, the reinforced learning, uh, for example, like a Molly Arm Bennett uh, type of approach uh, or the other uh, type of RL uh, type of algorithms uh, that we can use to do uh, better policy generation. And lastly and not least is that we're actually using uh, the VPA, the uh, Virtual Personalized Assistant Technology and Human in the Loop uh, for building much better collaborations uh, between the human coach uh, and the AI, right? So that's, uh, that's another uh, area, I think. Um, so this diagram, you, I don't know whether you have seen this one. This is kind of like a more a systematic uh, architecture diagram that we have. Uh, it shows from the ontology uh, to the uh, model to the interface of our system architecture. Um, and uh, I'm going to quickly advance that one. And this is a more, kind of like a more detailed, uh, layered architecture of, you know, between, uh, you know, across the, the interface to models, uh, to database, uh, and to the uh, type of uh, APIs that we have. And uh, these are several examples. This is the, uh, the multidimensional uh, PKS model that we have. Um, and this one is the, uh, the MIBA uh, the model uh, that we have built. And this one is a um, uh, agent model that we built uh, to enable the next generation contextual aware uh, agent framework to build this uh, AI. And this one is a human in the loop uh, and active learning. Um, and I think that's pretty much in terms of the algorithm part of it. And I think whoever is more interested in the details of these algorithms and so forth can come to us and then we'd like to uh, advance those along with uh, all the collaborations. And uh, here are some recommendations we have uh, for how government and industry can play a better role in this uh, edu uh, in the, uh, adaptive education arena. And, um, and here are some of our research <coughs> partners, uh, including MediaX, uh, I think, uh, right there. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, uh, you know, to have this opportunity and then love to have more discussions uh, offline.